by the grace of God, we have made our way to this service, and in this time, we are spiritually renewed. Welcome to worship with One United Church of Christ. Whether this is your first time here, you find your way here frequently, or you are a member of this faith community, you are welcome, and it is a joy to be together. As always, the bulletin that accompanies this service is available in the podcast section of our website at oneucc.org. It's also included in the Thursday church email, which is then shared to Facebook. We invite you to find that bulletin, download it, pray through the service, pray through the prayer list. Also, check out the announcement sections in the back and all the information that's in the bulletin. Highlighting a couple of those announcements, there is no drive-up prayer and blessing this Sunday because we're having outdoor worship. We are having outdoor worship on Sunday, conditions permitting at 10.30. The instructions for how to do outdoor worship, if you haven't done it yet, are in the bulletin. I would highly encourage you to find those before Sunday if it's your first time doing one of the outdoor services. The big things to remember are stay six feet from people you don't share germs with and bring a mask and pray that it doesn't rain. If it does rain, we will make the decision about the service by 8 o'clock on Sunday morning and then share that information to Facebook and the church email list will send out an email. If you're really in doubt and really unsure, feel free to give me a call. The worship committee is meeting this coming Wednesday at 6.30. That's an in-person meeting here at church, bring a mask. Also, we are going to be celebrating the life of the Reverend Jean Custer a little bit later on this month. Jean was one of our student pastors here while she was going through seminary, and she died back in the middle of March. A service to celebrate her life is being held in August, but due to the pandemic, it's family only. Jean's family, though, has requested memories and stories of Jean that can be shared with them and shared at the service. So if you have memories or stories of Jean that you would like shared, please send them to me and I will bring them to the service. I need to have those by August 21st, which is uh, Friday. If you have cards that you would like to send Jean's family, I have an address for that, so please contact me if you would like to send a card to her family. Also, Jean's service will be recorded and available later this fall, so if you would like to participate in that service by watching the video, we will make that available whenever it is available. The hearts behind us continue to call attention to the almost 7,400 people in Pennsylvania who have died from COVID-19. These hearts are also a call for all of us to keep praying and to keep doing the things that we need to do to value life. Maybe you've heard the stories coming out from the CDC and other groups this week that we could be in for the worst fall in public history, um, in public health history in the United States. I don't think that's any exaggeration. So friends in Christ, please keep doing the things that you need to do, washing hands, wearing masks, avoiding crowds, and praying to value your life and especially the lives of everyone in our community. Keep praying. And finally, thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all the ways that you are being the body of Christ in the places where you are. Our financial contributions have remained steady, if not ahead, of 2019, and we thank you for the ways that you're showing your support that way and remind you to please keep sending in your offerings as you are able. And thank you for the ways that you are showing God's love and care in this time. The world needs more kindness, and the world needs more courageous people who are willing to put God's love into action. And so friends, we take a breath and we are strengthened to be disciples, putting God's love into action in this time of worship. In faith, we gather to worship a God we cannot encounter through customary human senses. Here, in community, we reach out in words and songs, in silence and in prayers to express our devotion to this God, this God who became one of us in hope, in love, in courage. May we open ourselves and find God's presence, creator, Christ, and spirit as we worship today.
She waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Tell with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed. The young big church victorious shall be the church. Our foundation is indeed Jesus Christ, and we desire a deeper relationship with him. Following that desire, may we be in a time of prayer, clearing our hearts and our heads for more authentic relationship with Christ and with each other. Holy Jesus, you gather us into beloved community for the purposes of building up your realm on earth and supporting each other in the journey of following you. You desire us to be all in, holding nothing back in the life of discipleship. However, we confess we aren't entirely all in to living in your way. Our dedication to learning and growing in faith is half-hearted. When our schedules and other commitments allow, we are community. We really don't know how to eat together safely at the moment, and our prayer lives could use work. God. We struggle to be authentic with each other. We struggle to invite each other into the deep wonders and questions of our lives. Too often we play it safe and wade only into the shallows of each other's stories. Forgive us when our fears and deeply ingrained cultures hold us back from really being community. Forgive us when we place other priorities ahead of living your ways. We pray for transformation and for a vision of how we can be a stronger community of disciples together. Amen. The quality God looks for in discipleships is faithfulness, not perfection. And the times when our faithfulness is lacking, we are still treated with grace. We are forgiven and freed to live anew. For this we can say, thanks be to God. Amen.
Once again, will you join me in prayer? Your word is powerful, O God. As we hear it today, may we be inspired in the living of our faith. Strike us with a a vision of your divine community and move us with knowledge of your truth so that we are ready to serve whenever and however you call. Amen. As some people have fantasy sports teams, other people, definitely not me, have fantasy congregations. What would the perfect church be like? Our scripture reading today describes the ideal Christian community. This reading from the book of Acts takes place within the earliest days of the Christian church. As we hear these words, I invite you to listen for the things the ideal church does and the qualities it possesses as we hear Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles, All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distributed the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with simplicity and gladness. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to their community those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Churches can be unusual places. When I was growing up, my home church seemed like the perfect church. We were growing rapidly through most of my formative years. I had friends at church and great adult mentors. My pastor was awesome. Our music director was incredible. We had a fabulous music ministry. We had an amazing mission project in Honduras. And my church seemed to be a place where lives were changed. My life was certainly changed there. When I entered seminary, I held my home church in my mind as the perfect example of what a congregation should be. Yet, I didn't realize all the cracks that existed, how much of the congregation's energy came from the pastor and the ridiculous amount of hours he worked, the unexpected biases and prejudices of my fellow church members I loved and didn't realize they believed so differently from me, the complicated issues with church finances and property management, and the utter lack of ministry for young adults, which was jarring after a childhood of solid Christian nurture. I still love and adore my home church to this day. One of the surprise blessings of the pandemic has been for me the ability to worship with them more frequently than once a year. Even though now I realize all the ways my home church was and still is, an imperfect congregation. Churches are unusual places. Every congregation, regardless of denomination, size, ministries offered, theologies held, has one thing in common. They're made up of people. And people are weird and annoying and lovely. Because every congregation is made up of people, no congregation is ever going to be perfect. As a pastor, I get nervous whenever someone calls a congregation they're part of as perfect. And I think to myself, oh honey, how long is it going to be before we burst that bubble? Some of us who have changed our church membership in the course of our lifetimes have done so in search of the perfect church. Lay people are looking for the perfect church to belong to. Clergy types are looking for the perfect church to serve. Yet there is no perfect church, only congregations made up of maddeningly, delightfully imperfect people, just as we ourselves are imperfect. If you have ever struggled with realizing a congregation you're part of is not perfect, today's sermon is for you and for me. Maybe it's comforting to know that the church from its earliest days struggled with being a community of disciples. 
We tend to think the church was perfect, absolutely perfect in the years following Jesus' ascension. And if only we could return to those times. Our scripture reading for this week, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, unhelpfully reinforces this image. Luke, the author of Acts, paints a vivid portrait of the early church. In verse 42, he tells us Jesus' followers devoted themselves to four practices— the apostles' teaching, community, the breaking of bread, and prayers. Then in verses 43 through 47, Luke elaborates on these practices. The disciples were the heirs of the ministry begun by Jesus, as they were the ones who journeyed with him from his baptism into his ascension. The apostles carried on in his way and tradition, working signs and wonders in sight of all, and of course, teaching by word and example how life following Jesus is to be lived. Luke also tells us the early Christian community held all things in common, which here refers to a sharing of physical and spiritual needs, much like a community of friends today would do. The early church even went so far as to share goods, possessions in common, making sure everyone who had a need was cared for. The early Christian community ate together a lot, like every day. After attending worship in the temple, they would gather in their homes and share a meal, a symbol of their solidarity both in worship and in community. And of course, prayer was an important practice of the early church. To conclude this depiction of the ideal church, Luke tells us God was adding to their number daily and the community was growing. Friends, this is just about the perfect image of a church. All the members were united, sharing in everything, holding nothing back from each other. They ate together. They prayed together. They worshiped together. They undertook real estate and financial transactions together. They literally witnessed God's signs and wonders among them together. And every day, every freaking day, God sent new members their way, Who wouldn't want to be part of such a community of disciples? A church where everyone gets along and lives in harmony? A church that is alive and growing? How many churches today yearn to nurture such a community? As lovely as this picture sounds, the early church wasn't as rosy as Luke paints it. Most all scholars believe Acts 2 is Luke's presentation of an idealized portrait of the early Christian church, something to be aspired to rather than something that actually existed in the first century. As we read a little bit further in the book of Acts, we discover the cracks, the real struggles of the early church, especially when it came to sharing material goods in common. Nevertheless, this idealized portrait of the Christian church in Acts 2 has merit for us, pointing us toward the things that Jesus would want us to do and guiding us in the ways we are to be church together. This passage also reminds us of the importance of devoting ourselves to community. This summer, as we remember who we are as followers of Jesus, and specifically this week as part of One United Church of Christ, We remember we are people of community. From the beginning, I have loved how much this congregation cares about community. We love community so much that we voluntarily show up 15, 20 minutes before a church meeting just to talk with each other. And if I need alone prep time, I have to get here 45 minutes ahead of the meeting starting. Imperfect though we are, We do care deeply about the people who call this congregation their spiritual home, and we care deeply about the community around us. Over the years, I've watched this congregation show love and care for people who are pretty difficult to love and care for, people other congregations would have chewed up rather quickly. I've cheered as this congregation has gone to bat for people that others would discriminate against and marginalize. I've worried as this congregation has tolerated unhealthy behaviors in the quest to be Christian and nice, struggling with the fact that while all people are most definitely welcome, all behaviors are not. The depth of care for others 
is a reason I love One UCC so much. The depth of our care shines through brightly right now in the ways that we are adapting to the pandemic. Yet right now, One UCC's big challenge is nurturing community in a time where physical gathering is tricky. We have relied being together on Sunday mornings to connect us. Even under the best circumstances, even without a pandemic, nurturing Christian community is a substantial undertaking. How are we to be a community of disciples? We can look to Acts 2, 42 through 47 for inspiration and guidance. Reading through this passage, I'm struck by how few barriers to authentic relationship there are in this ideal Christian community. These people are all in each other's business. They're sharing prayers and meals and worship and concerns and worries and joys and resources and everything. How can we do more of that and do it in healthy and appropriately boundaried ways? How can we break down more barriers and grow in authentic connections? At the moment, our physical distance feels like a significant barrier to one UCC building stronger community. How can we connect with each other when we don't even regularly see each other? Even though we're apart, we can engage in the practices of devoting ourselves to learning our faith, to prayers, and even to community. With the pandemic, though, doing these things looks differently than it has at any other time in our lifetimes. Like no other time we've experienced, we are being asked to step up in our practice of faith. For decades, we practiced faith passively in large part by showing up to church and doing churchy things together. This option really doesn't exist right now because being together, especially in large groups, puts all of us at greater risk. However, This is a time to be active and engaged in our practice of faith. This is a time that requires intentionality from everyone to be the church. We can still be community together, even though we're apart. We are community when we pray for our congregation, for the people on our prayer list, when these hearts call us to prayer, when we pray for each other and for our world. We are community when we call each other and send messages to each other, We are community when we send greetings to our church friends, which I would love to do on your behalf. So if you have greetings for the community, you can send them to me if you wish. We are community when we're doing what we're doing together right now, worshiping, apart but in the Holy Spirit, still together. One way in which we're creating stronger, more connected community is through taking the first steps toward developing a small group ministry. A small group, if you're not familiar with it, is just that, a group of about six to 10 people or so who do something on a regular basis together, whether that something is Bible study, reading books, discussing current topics or issues, or simply praying or another faith practice together. These small groups might be in person, they might be virtual, depending on the group's wishes and abilities. They are ways that we can get to know each other on a different, deeper level. Sometimes I wonder if the majority of us who regularly make up a part of One UCC, if we're together a community of introverts, which makes an interesting dynamic. As a fairly strong introvert herself, I find large gatherings to be intimidating. It's tough to build strong relationships in large group formats like worship. And when you just come for worship every Sunday and leave, that's really hard to build relationships as well it's much easier to find connection in a small group. I'm part of some small groups, some formal, some informal, and I find small group connection to be powerful, especially during this pandemic. Without my small groups of colleagues supporting me, I would be lost for this reason. For the possibility of stronger, more authentic community, I'm excited to see what small group ministry will do for our congregation. Stay tuned for more details on small groups this fall. I believe this is the next faithful step toward practicing community that Jesus would have us take. Yet, growing in community will be an imperfect step. The more we get to know each other, 
the more we will get on each other's nerves. We'll find out some things about each other we'd rather not have discovered. We'll be amazed by the places our journeys have taken us, and we will be inspired by each other. We will be asked to hold each other in prayer. We'll learn to depend on each other's strength and wisdom. We will drive each other bonkers and realize just how much we've come to value each other, flaws and all. God's grace will annoy the crap out of us and will take our breath away. Our faith will be that much richer and deeper for the experience of authentic community, community grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Dynamics like what I just described are really what happened in the early church. It wasn't all Jesus, sunshine, and roses. They argued and got mad at each other. They forgave each other. Sometimes they reconciled. Sometimes they didn't. They prayed with each other, for each other, and they were blown away by God's presence together. The earliest community of disciples was a beautiful, holy, chaotic mess. And my prayer is that our community of disciples may be the same, as long as our beautiful, holy, chaotic mess remains grounded in the wild, restless love of Jesus Christ. May it be so in our life together, today and in the days ahead. Amen. And one of the best places to ground a community is in prayer. And so, friends in Christ, I invite us to be in a spirit of prayer together. Gracious God, through the power of your spirit, we are together even while we're physically apart. And today we pray deeply for your body on earth, that the church may heal its divisions, be renewed in its purpose, and bring your perfect realm and our imperfect world into harmony. We also lift up our prayers for this faith community, O oh God. May one UCC become more what you intend it to be. Through the chaos of these days, we ask for clarity of vision about how we are to be your people, how we embody your grace. And O oh God, not only show us how we are to be community together, we pray for the courage to change so that we may grow into the fullness of what you want us to be. Today we raise to your care those we've named together on our prayer list. Please grant each one the healing and strength that they need. We pray for those whose names and situations rest on our hearts who can't be named to any list. You who know our deepest fears and heartbreaks, please grant us your love, grant us your strength. Holy God, we also pray for your comfort to be with all who grieve, whether the loss is long-standing or more recent. We pray for the family and friends of Jean Custer as they celebrate her life later this week. And we pray for the family and friends of Irma Drackley as they remember her life and mourn her recent death. May your peace be with all of them and all of us. Holy One, not only do we pray for those we know and love, we pray also for the world you love. We pray for Beirut as it rebuilds and all who are impacted there, from the government leaders of Lebanon to children receiving cancer treatments. May you help them rebuild. Give them your aid. Holy God, we also pray for our country that your wisdom may prevail in the face of selfishness, ambition, and fear. We pray for the health of our world, that we may be wise enough to care for the earth around us before we are scarred by our own neglect. We pray for those who live with heartbreaks we can scarcely imagine, for those trapped in homes with abusive partners, for those who've witnessed their parents' deaths, for those who've had to help families pick up the pieces, and for all who've dealt with violence and hatred within our own hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the great healer. You are our great hope. You know the fullness of the depths of our hearts. You know how violent we can be, how loving we can be. And you constantly call us into a truer reflection of your love. 
In the days to come, please give us a glimpse of your goodness. Remind us of your presence with us and fill us with your courage as we follow you and pray in the words you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, as we prepare to leave this time, may the grace of God deeper than our imaginations, the strength of Christ stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit richer than our togetherness guide and sustain us today and in every tomorrow. Amen.